Good evening to you. It's a privilege to be back here again tonight. <clears throat> Just a little bit hoarse. I haven't been preaching for a long time. The last three or four nights I've been preaching pretty hard. So it kind of strained my voice a little. Usually my services, the manager in them does the speaking. I just pray for the sick. So preaching something new, you could tell it the way I was handling it. That it was something new to me. But I love the Lord with all my heart. I trust tonight that he'll move in this little group of people. Have great blessings for you all. Do you believe he'll do it? Yes, he will. And now, he knows every one of you. I don't exactly see anybody before me that I do know. Let's just brother and sister Glover and their daughter sitting there. He's the only one I remember by face. But God knows every one of you. He knows you since you were born. All the food you ever eat, the air you breathe, God gave it to you. It all come from God. I was going to speak on a certain subject tonight, but tomorrow night, the Lord willing, I want to start back in a series of subjects in Genesis. And so I thought I'd just give a testimony tonight, start the prayer line. So we trust that God will bless. I've been much in prayer this afternoon, so I don't want to get that anointing from the sick away just now. I want to read some of the scripture. It's found over in 4th chapter of St. John, 46th verse beginning. So Jesus came again into Cain of Galilee, where he made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus came out of Judea into Galilee, he went unto him and besought him, he would come down and heal his son. For he is at the point of death. Then said Jesus unto him, Except you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The nobleman said unto him, Sir, come down, hear my child die. Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word that Jesus had said, or spoken unto him. And he went his way. And he was now going down, his servant met him. And told him, saying, Thy son liveth. He required of them the hour he began to amend. He said, Yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. So the father knew that it was the same hour in which he said unto him, Thy son liveth, and himself believed in his whole house. This is again the second miracle Jesus did when he came out of Judea and the Galilee. Can we bow our heads just a moment? Father, we're happy tonight to be assembled together in your house. Sitting back in the room there, hearing your servants speak of the wonderful things that you've done. Our hearts are more than elated. To think of the grace that thou hast bestowed upon us, thy unprofitable servants. Knowing that you give us the privilege to accept eternal life, be forever blessed in the land that's far beyond this that we live in now. And it is written that eye has not seen, ear has not heard. It has it in the heart of man what God has for them in store that love him. We pray tonight you'll bless this people. Thy servant, being a little hoarse, strain of voice. We pray now that you'll bless. Maybe this is for the purpose to add the most of it to the healing service. Trusting that you'll bless each one here. And may when we leave here tonight, may we be able to say like those who come from Emmaus that day, and walked with him and talked with him, yet didn't know it until he did something that made him recognize him. They said our hearts burned within us while we heard him. And may he do something tonight in such a way that everyone will recognize that the resurrected Jesus Christ here in this spring Yule season is with us alive today. Yes. Out from among the dead, alive forevermore. 
to live and dwell among man until he manifests himself in the rapture day to take home his church when we take on immortal bodies like his. Grant these blessings we ask in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> I was just thinking for a moment of this man, a distress. Perhaps one time he might have gathered himself with a group that didn't take up with Jesus so much. But there come a time when he had need. He must come. So he came to see Jesus because his son was laying at the point of death. He had to do something. Jesus said to him, Except you see signs, you'll not believe. But the man didn't speak back to Jesus. He said, Lord, come ere my son die. Now the man, I want you to notice something. <clears throat> Get this point in mind. The man wanted Jesus to come down to his home and heal his son. But Jesus did not grant his request in the way that he wanted it. Sometimes he doesn't do it for us that way. You might say, if I can get in the prayer line, if God would do a certain thing for me. But Jesus said, Thy son liveth. And the man believed his word. Now what if the man had not believed his word? It would have been different. The son would have died. Just like today, if you don't believe his word, you'll perish. There's his word, whosoever will let him come. But if you don't believe it, you'll perish in your sins. If you can't believe it for your healing, you'll probably die sick. Perish in your sickness. Young age. But if you'll believe the word that he said, then you shall have whatever things you ask for and what he's promised. I was speaking this morning to you people, probably of the same group. <clears throat> we asked the people to attend their own churches tonight. We didn't come to take anyone away from the church, expecting them tomorrow night again. We want everybody at their post of duty at their own church. Brother Reed's intention is not to take somebody from somebody else's church. He only wants the sinners who doesn't go to church to come to his church. Those who are already have a home church, I know Brother Reed told him for a long time, I know how his heart stands with God. I've sat across the table from him. I've worked with him side by side, knowing when the anointing of God was on, I know that I got a true friend in T. Richard Reed. If it wasn't, I would have known it. And I appreciate him. And so this morning I was telling of an event that happened over in Finland. A vision had been given here in America. How many were here this morning? Let's see your hands. You remember it then? Of a vision of a little boy being raised from the dead. How that's on the Finnish government. I have the seals from the Finnish government of a little boy who had been dead 30 minutes. Run over, mashed up, laying on the road in a horrible condition. God, some two years before that, it showed the vision of what was going to happen. The little boy was raised up from the dead. A few days ago, I was sitting with one of the managers, Baron von Bonneberg, a Baron of Germany, St. Petersburg, Florida. And he had a little German boy that got out behind the Russian lines. Up on the, close to the American zone where it connects with the Russian zone, he had two young sisters. The Russian soldiers run in was ravishing those girls to the floor. The father run in to take up for him to shot the father. Taking the girls and the boys up in the camp, put them in a coal mine. Would make the girls push coal out in the daytime, strip off, dance before those soldiers at night naked. One of them lost her mind, the other and forgot what happened, she died. This little boy made an escape. One day through some way got hit over in some stuff, got near the border, slipped out from under a load of stuff and got over into the American zone. It's been about eight or ten months ago since he come. He could speak pretty good English. He said, Brother Brown, the resurrection of that little boy in Finland sweeps all down through Russia. He all knew about it. The other little lad that I left off on the story this morning, 
that the car struck one of them, run over him, mashing his body up. He'd been laying dead on the road, which was raising the dead. The other little boy was taken to the hospital. The night following, the little girl healed with the braces around her, so forth. <clears throat> the people were very elated to see. I couldn't even speak their, their language. And the Holy Spirit raised out of the altar and said, That person sitting right there, thus saith the Holy Spirit, it come to pass that they did a certain thing, have certain disease, and the interpreter have to tell it. That would be just exactly right. It never fails one time, never has. And it won't. It can't. It's God. And then, I remember going home that night. They'd try to get me to go down to this other little baby. It wasn't dead yet. It was on the third day. They'd never washed it. Car struck it by the chin, cushioned it against out of a tree, mashed its little head, concussion of the brain. You know what happens there? Is in a terrible condition. And in the going of this, <clears throat> the little mother, father was so tore up till they lay at the hotel door when he started and he had to pull me over the top of him. It's campaign rules to go, go to make calls when we're in the campaigns because you go to one, it'll hurt the other one. Therefore, put everybody on the level, all come to meeting. So, the next day, this little woman, poor little thing, she was out there, and the interpreter, which was a lady, she said, Brother, she said, I wish you'd at least go down and say a word, let, say a word to that poor little father and mother. Their little boy's never come to himself yet. He's laying down there. I said, bring him up. So they brought him upstairs. So we went out there, of course, had to talk to an interpreter. And... That's the reason I don't have to talk hard meetings. In Africa, we had 15 different interpreters. I'd say one word like, Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I'd go back, sit down, get me a drink of water, and rest a while before it ever got through all the interpreters. One would say, a noise, make a noise, make go, bloop, 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 bloop. That meant Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Another would go, bloop, 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 bloop. That was Jesus Christ the Son of God. Into another tribe, into another tribe, into another tribe. They got through about 15 different tribes, Devin. So I go get a drink of water and talk to Brother Baxter a while. It's time to say, and he came to the earth to save sinners. Then I could go back and sit down and talk again, see? So it wasn't much talking to it. Takes a long time to get through it. <clears throat> Any type of a few minutes message, what I'd say in 10, 15 minutes here, it'd take an hour and a half here to get through it. So when we were coming down, this little woman met us out there, her and her husband, and she fell down on the floor. She began to say something in her Finnish dialect. And Miss Isaacson said, she's asking you to come and to make her little boy well. Doctors had done said there wasn't an earthly hope for him at all. So I said, well, I can't make her little boy well. And so she told her. And she said, well, you raised the other little boy up from the dead. And my little boy's not dead yet. Said, that's three times that I've seen the dead pronounced dead by doctors and raised up again. One of them testified over this pulpit when I was first year, second time here, Miss Hattie Waldorf, you remember? Phoenix, Arizona, died with cancer of the heart and colon. The next was a lady, or a man rather, in my city, the name of Elijah Perry, killed in an accident, taken, laid out by the doctor died. And he was raised up from the dead, living today, working on the Pennsylvania Railroad. And the next is this baby over here. This lady out here from Kennett, Missouri. Now, I know a lot of them thought she was dead. She might have been. The night the little blind colored girl was healed back here behind the place. You remember the can when it's here the last time. Now, she might have been dead. I don't know. I think she's in a coma. She come on down, testified, plumbed to California about her healing. Cancer may be sitting here tonight for all I know. And so, but I don't know where she was dead or not, I couldn't say. But anyhow, I know those three doctor statements that they were dead. Then this little boy, he, of course, he wasn't dead yet. But he was unconscious, hadn't gained consciousness since the third day. So then they said, come down to the hospital. 
Well, I, I said it's against the rules for me to leave the place here and go to the hospital. I'm praying for your boy. I said, by the way, are you all Christian? No. Well, I said, look, if the little bo- if you want a favor out of me, find a favor of me first. I said, if you ought to become Christians. Maybe God would have mercy on your little boy and would spare his life. But if, if you become a Christian, you might find favor with God. And even if God takes a little boy, he's just a laddie. He's only about six years old. I said, he'll go to heaven. And there'll be no accidents up there. Now I said, if you die a sinner, you'll never go to heaven and you'll never see him no more. But if, you, if he dies and God takes him and you're a Christian, you'll go up to live with him someday where there is no accident. But I said, then if you don't, then and, and if he might spare his life. So they seemed they couldn't lose in any way. So they want to become Christians. We knelt down and had prayer. They give their heart to Christ. Got up. When they got up from there, then the poor little mother, she was about 22 years old, I guess, 23. She said, uh, she come over bummer and all something to me. And the interpreter said, here's what she said. She said, now go heal my boy. Well, I said, that's awful lovely of you, sister, but I couldn't heal the boy. I said, the Lord Jesus has to give a vision first of what's going to take place, then I'll tell you. She said, go see vision. <laughs> I said, that's lovely of you, but I can't do that. God has to give it himself. She said, well, you've seen vision for other boy. And I said, yes, that's right. But I didn't ask for it. I didn't even know I was coming over here then. God just give it his just sovereign will. I said, well, I can't do that. And she said, uh, uh, she said, well, come down to the hospital. I said, no, uh, that would break the rule. I'll go into the room and pray. God can hear me in here just the same as he could in the hospital. So I went in, started it. She said, well, you go into the room. I'll wait till you see vision. <laughs> that was mighty sweet. But I said, he might not even give me a vision. He might not even speak a thing to me. I can't make him. It's just if he will. So Miss Isaac finally got him to go on to the hospital. So they, instead of going to the hospital, they went home. <clears throat> About 10 minutes, the phone rang. And you ought to see the phones in Finland. <laughs> it's got a long stick like that. You put it back in here and turn on a crank like this. So they called up and said, has he seen vision yet? No. <laughs> About 10 minutes later, she called again, seen vision yet? No. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Isaac said, it might not even see one. You all just go ahead and serve God and be thankful and believe your little boy is going to get well. Well, all down Plumondo Church time, she called about every 15, 20 minutes and asked if it's seen a vision. What was going to happen? I said, he might, God might tell me he's going to take him. I said, if he's going to take him, well, that's all that we can say. Thy will be done. So he said, well, we went to church and as the night the little girl was healed, I told about this morning. On the road home that night, we went up upstairs. Miss Isaacson went to her room. Brother Jack Moore and Brother Lindsay was in a room together. Brother Baxter and Howard, my brother, was together. I stay in a room to myself on account of vision. So I just walked in. And I hope if I got some Canadian friends here that you won't think hard of me. <clears throat> in Canada, Howard gave me some candy, candy that they had up in Canada. And they haven't got much sugar. So, oh, it tastes horrible. So he told me going in that night, said, Bill, you remember that Canada candy? And I said, yes. He said, you ought to taste this from Finland. <laughs> Two little square pieces of candy. I just put it in my hand. I had my Bible. Now I went on into my room. It's great big marble tables. They have their very old-fashioned. I laid the Bible down on the table like that, walked out. It's about 12 o'clock at night. It's just dusty. Didn't get dark as April. Done coming almost daylight. They only have one day a year, you see. Six months is dark, six months is sun. And it's the land of the midnight sun. <clears throat> Thousands of Laplanders come down from the Laplands, driving caribou, riding a little sled of a thing, a caribou with a tongue right down between its legs. And here they come riding right along behind it, like that. So they're just gathered in from everywhere. Had 25,000 to mess a holly. And that evening when I went into the building, around 3 o'clock, there was a, a line, 30 abreast, for six city blocks. Solid people, besides a mess of Holy Field with 25,000. 
They love the Lord. Secondarily, our consoliers, I said this morning, love the Lord. Come through anything. Serve the Lord. Then, when I got up, I laid the Bible down, walked toward the window, and you could see them coming down through the parks just to talking and talking about what had taken place, and they were so happy and going on and talking to one another. And the women with great big boots on, young girls and all, and they were just great big thick skirts. They had to wear them winter and summer. It's the same. You hear this coming out through there, talking and going on. And after a while, I raised up my hands. I said, Oh, great Jehovah God, how wonderful. You're so good, Lord. Showing a vision to resurrect that little boy. Tonight, healed that little girl. The, a little bit before that, I never told it this morning. One of the chief persons there in the city, like a, some officer of some sort, his little girl being crippled. For about ten years from something, a fever had drawn her in her back. She walked kind of like this. And right there in the meeting, God made her whole. She walked out perfectly normal. And oh, it's been a marvelous night. Mr. Munion, and how many takes the voice of healing seen the picture of the things in there? They grilled up the crutches and things that they'd walked on in a bundle that big and couldn't hold them like that for one night service. As soon as they would see one thing done in the line of supernatural, they didn't have to pray for them. The only thing they does is get her out and walk out anyhow. Right. They believed it anyhow. You didn't have to. That's the way it is in any other nation besides America. But we're not that way somehow. It's too bad, but we're not. You know what's the matter? We've had too much doctrine pumped into us. We have to go ask Dr. So-and-so if that's right. He said, well, it's theology. The other one says, well, it's mental telepathy. The other says, it's the devil. Dr. So-and-so says, it's nonsense. Another doctor says it's of the devil. Oh my, no wonder you can't believe. No wonder you can't believe. Quit asking doctors so and so, take what Jesus said. Let that settle it. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's why you have Pharisees and that. They had to go ask the priest whether it was all right to do this or do that. That's the reason they failed to see Jesus and recognize who he was. Same thing you're failing to see the Holy Ghost today. The same thing, Christian friends, listen. They got churches and we got everything, but they're failing to see that grain of life there, the Holy Spirit, working signs and wonders among His people. What He promised to do. He said it'd be with us, even in us, to the end of the world. Standing there praising the Lord for His goodness. <clears throat> I was looking out, uh, out of the big window. It's kind of dusty. You could still read a paper in the street. Now it's wrong about 11.30 or 12 o'clock. All of them done got to their rooms. And I was standing there looking out the window like this, praising God across that big cedar mountains there. With my hands up, I was praising Him. I felt something strange. I thought it looked kind of light around where I was standing. I looked standing here to my side. And here He stood, arms crossed, looking at me. And setting before me that wasn't there before, one of those long jars, about that high. And it had two Easter flowers, I call them, I don't know what you call them, little flowers that come up, it's got a little bell shape on them, yellow, and some of them are white, comes up around Easter time. We call them, I believe they're called daffodils, is the right name of them, but they don't even grow in that country. But there it was. In this jar, I thought, well, what's that? And I noticed that one of them, laying towards the north, was laying flat on the table, down across the big high jar, laying down like this, and the other was bent down. And I looked at him. There he stood, just as he always does. He was a tall man, dark hair to his shoulders, olive complexion, barefooted, long white robe on, has his arms full, weigh about 200 pounds. He's always right under that light. And he stood there. He's looking at me. And I said, learned around, I started to kneel down. He said, what did your brother give you? And I said, two pieces of candy. And I laid them on the other a table. And he said, eat them. Well, I reached over and got those pieces of candy. And I put one in my mouth, began to chew it. I was intending to eat it that night. 
And I just had done it, just laid it down, walked over there and praised the Lord. And I started chewing that piece of candy, tasted good, swallowed it. And when I swallowed it, that Easter flower that was laying flat towards the north went, stood right up like that. And I looked at it. I didn't understand it. I looked back at him. He said, eat the other piece. And I put it in the mouth, and oh, it was horrible. And yet the same kind of candy, like a little block of chocolate. And I put it in the mouth. It tastes just like I imagine starch should taste. Just, I stuck it out like that, and I noticed this other Easter flower was hanging about halfway down. It started going down, 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 down. And I took it out and out. He said, fail to eat that, and the other boy will die too. And I put it back in my mouth, and I started chewing real fast and swallowed it real quick. And when I did, this one leaning towards the south went, Phew. Now that's just the way the boys fell when they got hit by the car. The one fell to the north, the other to the south. And there they both were standing. And I looked at him, I said, My Lord, I don't understand. What does this mean? He said, Go call the woman and say, Thus saith the Lord, Your son shall live and not die. Oh, he left me. I stood there. I was numb all over, as it was this morning, sitting on my bed. I started biting my fingers and feeling my hands. I thought, oh, if I could just get to talking, I, if I could get to talking. I thought, now my lips felt real thick. And I, I looked at my Bible. And I run out to the hall and let out a big scream. You all who know Brother Moore and you can ask him. I let out a big scream. First thing you know, doors being you know, open, people are looking out. And I said, come, Brother Moore, all of you, and Sister Isaac, and all of them come out. I said, Sister Isaac, go call that little mother and tell her, thus saith the Lord, her son will live and not die. So she got out of that little old phone there where the lift was, or elevator, what we call it here, they call it lift thing, takes you up. And she rang this little phone. She rang the home of the mother, and they got news the boy was dying. So the mother had left the baby setter with her little teeny baby and it went up to the hospital. The hospital is just a house up there. Just an ordinary house where they had to put the sick in. So she rang the hospital and they got her to the phone. They said the boy was dying. Got her to the phone, Sister Isaac said, Brother Branham has just seen a vision and said to tell you, thus saith the Lord, the little mother was screaming. Said, don't fear the boy ain't going to die when the little mother can get to a place where she could. She said, ah, oh, well, I know it. We were standing over him just a few minutes ago, and he raised up in the bed. We done washed him. He's got, got a drink of water. We're going to take him home in the morning. Friend. God had done answered her prayer. Friend, I never touched the boy, neither one of them. Never touched any of them. It was God in answer to their prayer. That had done it. He only showed me and said, Go tell this. Go say this. See there? So that don't make me a divine healer. I have nothing at all to do with it. If I tell Brother Reed here, You go tell a certain man a certain thing, that would be me sending a message. And some of us are born, friends, to be preachers. Brother Reed, many others. Some of us are born to. Uh, uh, be musicians. I noticed that young lady tonight beating on those things there. Telephone. Playing the organ. Piano. Well, I don't know nothing about that. Well, I wouldn't know if it's in tune or out of tune. I couldn't tell it. God never sent me to play music, but I was born a seer. Now, they play the music for the glory of God. That's a way of preaching the gospel. The man preaches it by the word. And my way is by vision. Won't you believe all the witnesses that God has sent to you? Can't you know that God's in them songs when you sing it, something blesses your soul? Is there something when the preacher's preaching it just confirms everything to you? Isn't that right? Now he has other gifts. There's first apostles, secondarily prophets, gifts of healing, workings of miracles, teachers, so forth. Is that right? All for the perfecting of the church. Is that true? Amen. Now, don't disbelieve. Have faith in God. God shall bring it to pass. You believe it? Amen. Let's bow our heads. Sister Reed.
I'm thankful. There hasn't been a one that's come in in wheelchairs, cots, or stretchers, but what's one out, as far as I know. There's one lady sitting here tonight, looks like has a broken limb. Something. The Holy Spirit may reveal to her what it's all about. He's the healer of all diseases, afflictions. Oh, Lord, as my mind drifts back now down across the time of these few years, the hundreds of thousands of people, well, we're just one day nearer home now. This day is fixing to turn the page. It'll be another day for history. A day that we'll have to face on earth the judgment someday. One more part of the service. Prayer for the sick, the altar call. Bless your servants everywhere tonight. The gallant ministers of faith who are standing in the platform proclaiming the gospel without fear. Bless them through around the world, Lord. Throughout all the nations. Send Jesus thy Son. This old world soaked in Christian blood. The altars are bathed with tears, crying, Come, Lord Jesus. Someday he shall come. We'll see him. Now, Father, tonight is my lot to pray for the sick. As this little group is gathered out through this stormy weather, loving you, they've drove many miles, some of them, no doubt some are sitting here who are very sick. Some are sitting here who are wondering. God, may everybody go home tonight happy, rejoiced, and healed. May the sinners be converted, the backsliders reclaimed. May it be a glorious night. Get glory out of the service. And now, Almighty God, who brought again our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead, sent down his angel to be a ministering spirit to direct your servant through this life. May he stand by my side tonight here and manifest Jesus Christ to this audience. For I ask it in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Thousand a week all over the world. The other day I got a letter back from Germany. A lady had been crippled in a chair with arthritis for years. She'd read my little book, Man Sent from God. It's translated in German, Finnish, Swedish, Afrikaans, oh, I don't know. So she <clears throat> got the little handkerchief. She tucked the instructions and pinned it on her underneath garment, put her hand over there. She said, now, devil, you get out of here. Chopped right up out of the chair and went walk across the house. Went on. And the baby had a sunstroke, I guess, because about 11 o'clock in the day, he's out in the harvest field with his daddy, began to cry in my head. They sent him in, and he laid on his mother's lap and died about dinner time. Elijah had a little room. She'd built Elijah a little room on the side where he could pass by. Had a bed in there and a stool, a water pitcher. She took him and put him on the prophet's bed. Good place to put him, wasn't it? That's right. Her husband come, he said, saddle a mule, go forward now, don't you stop. <clears throat> he said, don't go over to Mount Carmel, because it's neither Sabbath or new moon. The prophet will not be there in the mountain. He had a cave out there he was staying in. He said, it's all all right. He said, saddle this mule and go forward to the servant, and don't you stop, lest I bid you. I like that. Go forward, don't stop. She had an eternity. So when... The prophet came out, seen her coming. He said to Gaze, his servant, he said, here comes that Shunammite. Said she's grieved in her heart. I don't know what's wrong with her. Said God's never revealed it to me. See, God don't tell his prophets everything. He said, God's kept it secret from me. He said, is all well with thee? Is all well with thy husband? Is all well with the child? She said, all is well with me. All is well with my husband. And all is well with the child. I love that. Her baby lay in a corpse, but all's well. She knew that was God's prophet. 
And she knew that that was God's man of the hour. And she knew that God was in his prophet. She knew that if she could only get to that prophet, she'd find out why God taken her baby. I like that. I think Martha used the same thing when she met Jesus. So uh, the prophet looked at her. And so he, she fell down at his feet, gazed and jerked her up around his master like that. Then she began to reveal to him what had happened. Now watch. He said, Gehazi, you take my staff and go forward. Don't you salute anybody. Don't speak to anybody. If anybody speaks to you, don't you even speak to them. And go lay this staff upon the baby. Now Elijah knew that everything he touched was blessed. But now if he could get the woman to believe it, I think that's where Paul got his handkerchiefs. See, he knew God was in him. And Elijah knew what he blessed, what he put his hands on was blessed. That's why we have the order of laying hands on the sick. What you touch is blessed. That's the reason from Paul's body they take handkerchiefs and aprons. That's the reason the shadow of Peter passed over the public and they recognized it. Let's get that Shunammite woman just a little farther. I love that case. Look, but she didn't have no faith in the, hat, in, the, in the stick. She said, as the Lord lives and your soul lives, I'll not leave you. Determined. I like that, don't you? She said, I'm going to stay right with you. So he girded up his loins and started off. Got over to the home and everybody weeping and screaming and carrying on. So Elijah didn't know what to do. Now watch. He went into the room where the dead baby was laying. And Elijah walked up and down the floor, to and fro, to and fro. Not prayer now, walking up and down the floor. Then he went and laid his body on the baby's body, his lips against the baby's lips, his nose against the baby's nose, his head against the baby's head. And he laid there, God in him. And the baby's flesh got warm. He got up, walked back and forth, up and down the floor again. Come back. Laid down across the baby again. His lips against the baby's lips. His nose against the baby's nose. His hands against the baby's hand. And the baby sneezed seven times. Wish I had time to go in that number seven there. What do we have? Sneezed seven times and come to life. God was in that prophet. And that woman knowed if she could ever get... That prophet, and God was in his prophet, and she'd ever get in contact with his prophet, she would find out about her baby, and her baby was restored back to her alive again. Because she respected God in his servant. Is that right? That's why the people got healed from the handkerchiefs Paul sent. They know God was in that apostle. And they know he was not only an apostle, he was a prophet. And they took from his body handkerchiefs and aprons and laid on to the sick. And evil spirits went out of them and they were healed. Is that right? Let's bow our head. Lord Jesus, here lays before me your handkerchiefs. Some dear old, maybe blind daddy sitting out here in a little cabin somewhere behind a cotton patch. Behind a little old cooking stove tonight. Waiting for this handkerchief to come. Maybe some mother out there wondering just when the handkerchief will return with a little afflicted baby laying on the bed. And she's bathing it now to put it to sleep, waiting for this handkerchief to return. God looked out on the scene. We're taught by one of the writers that when Israel come out of Egypt, following the command of God, got up to the Red Sea. The mountains on one side, deserts on the other. Pharaoh's army coming, and the Red Sea had him trapped. Said God looked down through that pillar of fire with angered eyes, and the sea got scared and rolled back, and Israel crossed over. God grant tonight, as I lay hands upon these handkerchiefs, when they touch them sick people, may God look down through that pillar of fire again with angered eyes. And may the sickness leave the people, and they cross over into the promised land of good health and strength. Grant it, Lord. I bless these handkerchiefs 
in the name of thy Son, Jesus, for that purpose. Amen. All right, Billy. Oh, from 250 to 100. What was that? What we call the first part of it? 1 to 15. Let's call the second part, last part of that. Let's call the Let's call your prayer cards T they give out this afternoon. Call from 85 to 100. We usually get about, about 15, about as many as we've been able to get on the platform, then we get the audience. Who's got T85? Oh, wait, 85, 95, that's right. T, all right. All right. 86, 87, 88, 89, 90, on to 100. Line up first. Rest of you, look this way at me just a minute. How many in here wants to be healed tonight? Raise up your hands. I want to be healed, Brother Brandon. How many here say, I haven't got a prayer card? But I want to be healed anyhow, Brother Brandon. Raise up your hand. Just look a solid mass all up and down these lines. Everywhere. <clears throat> My Christian friend, surely God has testified enough to you to let you know I'm telling you the truth. If you look this away and pray and believe this story that I'm telling you to be the truth, just accept it, say it's the truth. Well, all by the merits of the Bible, by the vindication of science, by what you see yourself, the Bible said in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. Is that right? Amen. How many says the Bible says that? Say amen. Amen. The Bible said Jesus Christ was the same yesterday and forever. Is that right? Yeah. He said he didn't do nothing but what the Father showed him. Is that right? Yeah. He said, what I do, you shall do also. Is that right? Yeah. That makes the Bible right. Yeah. All right. Here's the scientific proof of it, of this day. Same pillar of fire. Got a right. You have a perfect right to ask George J. Lacey. You have a perfect right to look into it. I ask you to. Here it is in this book. Addresses, everything. Any of those testimonies, anything of them things, they're everyone bona fide. Ask them and see. Call them up. If you're a little skeptic, I'll pay for the call. All right. Then, here the Holy Spirit every night is doing the same things that Jesus Christ did when he was here on earth. Is that right? Amen. So there's three witnesses, the Bible, science, and the Holy Spirit here present now to do it. Is that right? It would be a sin for you to disbelieve. Of course, unbelief is sin. It's the only sin there is. See, I don't believe I'll get to that this week while my boy's lining up the line there. Well. Some of the ushers want to help me? Or have you, got, you got all 15 of them? All right. I want to look at cards so they see somebody might be deaf and couldn't stand up, you see. Somebody's not with them to pour them out. Now, <clears throat> I want you to be in prayer. I want you to believe with all your heart. Here's one thing that's, that kind of makes me wonder, friend. For a minute, let's just think of how that is that the first patient is bringing you. What what alarms me is amongst the Holy Ghost people who's taught to believe in the supernatural. And then when you see God in his actual power proved beyond a shadow of doubt. It looks to me like everybody ought to fly home to heaven almost. But you know what? We said some of them, well, that was very nice. <clears throat> yes, Lord. We appreciate that, Father. Go home as if it was just one of the regular routines of the day. Why, brother, sister, if it was in Africa, and the Holy Spirit to move out through that audience there and call somebody and tell them what was wrong with them out there or some sin in their life or something done. 
Brother, you'd hear screams for four hours. You couldn't quieten them. Everything would fall to their knees and give their hearts to Christ right there. What's no, no, not hard to call people to God there. Just, just let them see something that's supernatural. That's all they want to know. They've read it in the Bible, and when they see it, then they believe it. But today we explain it all the way, you know, it's something else. That's the reason we're not getting anywhere. That's the reason we haven't got any revival in America. I heard Billy Graham make that statement a few days ago. Said he went all around over the country everywhere, but we didn't have no revival. I thought, yes, Billy, that's right. Next time we get to talk to him, I'm going to tell him why. That's right. If you'd done what George Jeffries told him over there in London, England, teach the baptism of the Holy Ghost, it'd stay put. <laughs> it'd stay there. That's right. When he stood by Louis Petrus and sat right by my side, he said, I'm going down to England and receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost myself. <laughs> All right. If you'd get that started, for those people freezing to death out there, I feel sorry for him. That big bunch of ministers trying to keep him squeezed down. I believe the boy would really get out, but he's tied down. He knows what's the truth. So far, God, pray for them boys. Pray for them all. <clears throat> he's one of the millers, Hyman Appleman. I want you to be sure to pray for him. I'm to meet him in a few days. God gave me a vision about him. All right, already. All right, lady. I want you to come here just a minute, my sister. Now, when you people come, I don't want you to come like you're coming to touch a totem pole or something. That won't work. Yeah. No. There's nothing here. I'm just your brother. No more than a sight of God than anything or that micro Well, I'm more than a microphone, of course, because we're human beings, son and daughter of God. But when you come, I want you to believe that you're coming into His presence. Now I want you to come with a reverent, true heart, believing with all your heart that God is going to do something for you. Then ask God and you'll receive what you've asked for. Amen. Come reverent. Come like Martha did when she fell before Jesus. She said, Lord, if you'd have been here, my brother not died. But even now, whatever you ask God, God will do it. There you are. There's what you are. Now, lady. You're being the first patient tonight. Perhaps let's just take a little drama, you and I, and talk a few minutes. If, I, if we were living back in Bible times, and now you'd walk down the street, and you'd seen Jesus of Nazareth. He was wearing this suit of clothes, this shirt and tie. You'd walk up to him, and you'd say, Lord, have mercy on me. Now, I don't know what's wrong. There might not be nothing wrong. If there isn't, be assured he'll tell you about it. If you're assured to deceive, you'll find out what takes place in a few minutes. <clears throat> All right. So, if you're deeply sincere, which I believe you are, if you'd walk to him, he would go to talking to you like I am. He'd say, why, well, woman, um, something or another. He'd carry a little conversation with you like he did the woman at the well. Then he'd go right straight to where your trouble was and tell you. He'd say, well, you, you're living in sin or you, you did a certain thing or you got a tumor or you got a TB or, or whatever it might be. He'd tell you what was wrong with you. And then he'd say, you'd say, Lord, will thou help me? You'd say, I can if you believe. You'd say, Lord, I believe. You'd say, now according to your faith, be it unto you. Is that right? That's, that's the way he done. Yeah. So, so if he's the same yesterday, day, and forever, he just moves on his service and does the same thing. Yeah. It's the same Jesus. Yeah. Just up just a little on that, if you will. Just a little louder on that. That's right. There's something about that song that the angel of the Lord loves. I've looked at the woman three or four times. There's no response nowhere. So he just isn't here yet. So <clears throat> for the anointing. Now, let's you and I talk just a minute. 
and then maybe he will speak to us. Do you, um, do you believe that, uh, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever? Do you believe that God could make me know your life? Do you believe that? I, you know I don't know it. Because I don't guess I ever met you in my life. We're strangers to one another. But if God could let me know it, and if he would, would it make you happy? Make, then would that confirm, if I've told now, look here, I want the audience to get this. This woman a stranger, I a stranger. Now, if you can just get it, this one woman right here ought to settle it for the whole night, if God will do it. He might not speak to a woman, I don't know. That's up to him. But if he this morning turned this away, lady, I don't know anything about you, do I? I'm a perfect stranger to her. And I'm a stranger to you all out there. I don't know nothing about you. But if the Holy Spirit would reveal even one thing, it ought to make this audience say, Thank you, Lord Jesus, I believe you. Now, this, the person don't have to be on the platform here. You people out there, you all without prayer cards now, look this way and just believe with all your heart. And just start praying and asking God to help you, to give you faith. The angel of the Lord will come in before we start the platform. Friends, I've told you the Bible truth. I know there's faith in the audience. Just have to wait till I see something break forth over there. We're all home folks because the church is not even filled up tonight. You see, we're just sitting here waiting. I want somebody without a prayer card to pray. So that you'll see that it ain't a prayer card you have to have for the Lord to speak to you. What do you think about it, lady? You? You believe? Well, the lady next to you is praying, then I'll talk to her. You're praying, aren't you, lady? The little lady in the blue dress there. Yeah. I was trying to get to this lady there, but I see. Have you a prayer card? You have a prayer card. Do you believe me to be God's prophet? You do. There's really nothing wrong with you, but you're thinking about somebody that's away from here. Is that the truth? Raise your hand. Isn't it a woman that's got complications just a whole lot? She's nervous and upset and broke. Isn't that right? If that's the truth, raise your hand. About a middle-aged woman. All right, stand up to your feet. If that's the truth, wave your hand to the people. Now you go home and lay that same hand on the woman. And she's going to get well. God bless you. Now, do you believe? Now the Holy Spirit's here. Now look this way, lady. Do you believe me to be his prophet? Yes. I know now what's wrong with you. You're suffering with cancer. Is that right? That cancer's bad. And that cancer is on the breast. Is that right? It's on the right breast. Is that right? That's right. Mm -hmm. All right. Go and be made well. Right. Right. Have faith. 
now the angel of the Lord's in your presence. Have faith. How do you do, lady? Do you believe me to be God's prophet? Do you believe what I told about that angel is the truth? You're, you're studying about somebody, too. That's your boy. And your boy's a minister. Is that right? He's in a hospital or sanitarium. Isn't that right? You're worried about him. God bless you. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that you bless the boy. Son of God, yes. you believe me to be his prophet? Yes. You, uh, you have a tumor. Yes, sir. Is that right? Yes, sir. And is that tumor located on your ear, yes. behind your left ear? Is that right? It don't show yes. from here, but it's right behind. There you are. All right. Now go on. Oh, my Have faith. Don't doubt. Believe. What do you think about it sitting there with your sleeves rolled up, sir? Do you believe me to be God's prophet? You're sitting there crying because you're in a bad shape. You got high blood pressure. Is that right? If you don't get healed, you're going to die. Have a stroke pretty soon. You know that, don't you? Won't you stand up and accept your healing then? If God's here, pulls you out of the audience and say, oh, God bless you. God be with you. that you're near death too, don't you? You're just about as bad as you can get with your disease. You have diabetes in the worst form. Is that right? Nothing can help you but God. Will you accept God as your Savior and healer tonight? I mean, your healer, rather. You have accepted him otherwise. You believe that he'll be your healer now? Then in the name of Jesus Christ, may you be well. <laughs> Don't doubt. Have faith. Now put your face up there, brother. Straighten yourself up and go acting like you're perfectly normal and well. Hallelujah. You believe in? You have a rupture, don't you, sir, sitting there at the end of it? Oh, fair sister, I've seen you praying for him. I don't know, you never seen you, but that's the truth. That's right. This little fellow sitting right behind you there has got a lot of fear on him. You don't know he's real nervous and upset. He's got prostate trouble. You know that's true. You want to accept your healing? Too? 
All right, sir. The Lord bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Come, sir. You believe, sir? I believe I find a true heart in you. You believe me to be God's prophet? I never seen you or heard of you in my life. But it's not for you, it's for this baby. Is that right? That baby's been under surgery, operation, for a tumor. It's got another one. And that tumor's inside of its mouth, its jaw. Is that right? And haven't you been writing or corresponding to somebody about... Yes, and, sir. Is that right? Oh, That's right. Yes, sir. And you was advised to come here to find out about the operation for the baby. I'm not reading your mind, brother. But God's Spirit is here. Lord God, creator of heavens and earth, bless this baby and this man. Have faith, come lady. You don't get over that stomach trouble? Go eat what you want to. You believe that? All right, go do it. Somewhere right in there, there's a little girl. Or some, I see, keep seeing a couple of little girls standing before me here somewhere. It's got something wrong with their throat, like tonsils or something. It's, it's up here before me, but I can't tell where the children's at. They must be under somebody. So there they are. That's right. That's the two children. Go fear you not, Mother. Amen. The Holy Ghost is here. Sitting right back there. Y'all get over that bladder trouble. You're sitting right back there on the end of the road. If you do, stand up, accept your healing, Jesus Christ. Make you well. What about it? How many here wants to be healed now? 